Josiah, J-O-S-I-A-H, hazard mitigation? Well, according to FEMA, it is any sustained action taken to reduce or eliminate long-term risk to people and property from natural hazards such as flooding, storms, highways, etc. Basically, it's items you take, items you undertake in advance of a hazardous event. Uh, this is opposed to, let's say, evacuation or a shelter plan, which is basically a bunch of steps you're going to take to um, respond to a disaster once it occurs. Uh, there are several benefits to hazard mitigation. Uh, there are federal funds available through the Federal Emergency Management Agency to uh, for communities for undertaking a hazard mitigation process. I don't know how to fix that. <laughs> um, mitigation is often much less expensive Preventative measures are much less expensive than recovery from a disaster and effects that might occur. Um, and it, you know, in general, allows a more uh, cost-effective and efficient approach to using any city's resources. <laughs> there are several key components to a hazard mitigation plan. Uh, first is identifying the hazards that may affect the community 
assessing, uh, you know, prioritizing the hazards that might occur. questions, I can, I can stop at any point. As part of the hazard mitigation plan, a inventory of critical infrastructure was also undertaken. Uh, the, the assessment looks at various municipal structures um, and basically looks at every hazard that was identified and the effect that those hazards might have on that critical infrastructure. So as you can see here in the previous plan, uh, flooding uh, along the Mill River and the Connecticut River was determined to really only affect the city mostly if the levee system was damaged. Um, severe snowstorms could affect the entire city. Um, example, hurricanes again, the entire city, especially uh, with flooding in the river and Connecticut.
uh, the third part of the hazard mitigation plan is identifying existing and <coughs> mitigation strategies. Um, the hazard mitigation committee worked to identify current mitigation strategies that the city is undertaking, um, whether it's in municipal plans or zoning ordinance or the subdivision um, regulations and identified existing strategies and also looked at potential new strategies uh, that could be undertaken in the next five years. And there's a list of uh, new strategies in your handout that were prioritized as proposed implementation, a list of proposed implementation tasks uh, by the city. Each one was prioritized on a scale of very high, high, medium, and low. And so you'll see here, uh, for example, one of the very high priority items was to develop a preliminary project proposal and cost estimate for updating the current 911 system, including feasibility of the first 911. Uh, so this is just, just to get into the process quickly. This is a public meeting um, that's occurring at the beginning of the hazard mitigation process. Uh, after this point, the hazard mitigation committee that we discussed is going to meet and, uh, ide and update different portions of the plan uh, over the course of three or four meetings. And once that uh, updating process is completed, there will be another public meeting in June uh, at which the updates are presented to public and the public will be um, provided with the, the revised plan and invited to uh, comment upon it. So that's the point. Yes, and then the committee will be on June 18th at 7 p.m. After which point the plan will be committed to FEMA and FEMA for the review. So that's basically um, our plan. I'm, I'm happy to um, answer any questions that anybody has. And if you have any questions, um, did you get a call from um, another guy? And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. You can also contact me at uh, Ruth McGrath from Florence. I have a question. I'm a member of the Disability Commission in Northampton, but this is a personal question. Are the disabled considered in this kind of a plan? People in wheelchairs, how to evacuate them, that kind of thing? So the, the focus, and I said, so not as much on evacuation. That would be a different aspect of, of the plan, of emergency planning, which is certainly, I think, something you know, that should be undertaken. Um, there is the identification of um, critical populations that might need assistance or might be more affected by a hazard. So, for example, um, senior centers are identified, um, daycare facilities are identified, so groups that might need more assistance during evacuation. One, in the one, one, one. This, you talked about 911, this includes communication. Mm -hmm. So you've got deaf people, you've got hearing impaired people like myself. Mm -hmm. um, they would all be considered in this? Definitely. Um, I, I can't speak specifically to the measures of the 911 system, mm -hmm. but my understanding, I don't want to speak too much for the, the system, but I, I'm assuming that it, it, it um, employs different methods of, of contact. Texting, email, phone calls. Yeah, it's just when you're talking to a wide group and we do have a large deaf community in Northampton, so it's, you know, one-on-one -on -one with a relay operator or with a TTY or something like that, or I use my computer for a TTY. But when you're talking a wide group of people, that kind of communication can bottleneck really quickly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll definitely have to do that. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? Thank you so much. I think the next one will be a lot more.